prominent college in India. What is it? It's full form? Indian Institute of Technology. One of our friends studied there and he had a very difficult project guide. He did his PhD, yes, it's a very difficult PhD guide. So he said, for me, IIT was the Institute of Infinite Torture. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever it is, uh, it is, if you understand the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, we all can get IIT. We can actually get in. We can get the wisdom that can help us face life's challenges. So let's look at these three things. The first is intelligence. Now, intelligence can have many different aspects to it. Even according to contemporary psychology, we have intelligence in terms of seven or eight kind of intelligences. We have linguistic intelligence, or musical intelligence, kinesthetic intelligence. But here, when the Gita talks about intelligence, buddhi, it talks about in the particular sense. Intelligence is the faculty that aligns perception with reality. So, so there is a world out there. Hmm? Say this is the reality. And then we are the self. So we have our senses, we have our mind and then we have the soul. So soul, mind, senses. And then from here we perceive the world perception. So what is intelligence? Intelligence is the faculty that aligns perception with reality. So perception and reality they are aligned to as much degree as is possible. Now conversely when we say somebody is mentally unstable, somebody is to use a more polite word, mad. <laughs> it's the less polite word, but anyway. So what does that mean? A person is getting some hallucinations. They hear some voice. They see some figures. Those, they are not there at all. What that means is perception and reality are not aligned for them. So intelligence, the more intelligent a person is, the more they can align perception with reality. What is actually going on over here? What is happening? That they can understand. So, now from this perspective, Prabhupada says that intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective. What is going on over here? What is more important? What is less important? How should I deal with the situation? So, the Bhagavad Gita tells that to align our perception with reality in the context of functioning in this world, it is to understand that the world, the Gita says, is a place of distress. It is Dukkhalaya. Now, this can seem to be a very pessimistic statement. If you tell someone this world is a place of distress, you know, this world Dukkhalaya. Why are you so pessimistic? So actually, it's not that simple. If just change the statement, instead of that you say, life is tough. Now if you say life is tough, everybody will agree, isn't it? Yeah. Even the wealthiest of people, even the most famous people, uh, even they have problems. Life is tough for everyone. So now, why is it that when we say life is tough, we can agree with it. But when the world is a place of distress, that seems pessimistic. So life is tough, this statement, this statement seems realistic. Hmm? But the world is a place of distress, how does it seem? Pessimistic. So that is actually for one, there is one particular reason for this. Because when the Gita is saying that this world is a place of distress, 
it is including within itself an understanding that while we have this world there is another world beyond this world this is the material world this is the spirit beyond it is the spiritual world there is a material level of reality the physical reality the reality that we experience but there is another reality beyond this and the gita's focus is when it says this world is a place of distress the point is there is another world that is a place of happiness and that is what we should focus on the generally for that so this is the gita's world view but in the contemporary world view most people think this is the only world that exists hmm? material world hmm? it is the only world the one and only world that people say that some people say oh you have become a krishna devotee that's uh, do you really want to do that you are becoming a different person okay but everybody is a devotee of something most people are devotees of matter see what do you say devotees of matter devotees of matter means that they think matter is all that matters that material things are the only thing that are important everything else okay that's, that's okay that's just something which not very important and then there are pure devotees of matter also <laughs> devotees of matter say matter is all that matters but pure devotees of matter they say matter is all that exists there is nothing beyond this at all now if we have this understanding that matter is all that exists or even matter is all that matters then such people think that okay if i have difficulty in my life then i have to find solution at this level of reality itself and if you say this world is a place of distress and for them the idea there is no world beyond this world there is no reality beyond this reality then such a statement seems to be a statement of great pessimism hmm? so the gita is not pessimistic at all but it is giving us an understanding of the nature of the world and along with that it is giving us if you consider the gita's teaching it is offering us another world view a world view where there is another level of reality and that means not only there is another world but we as as human beings we also have another dimension to us we are not just physical creatures we have a spiritual side to us we are not defined by our biology by our our height our weight our complexion our genes no It, oh, the gita's teaching is our identity it is greater than our genes and our genes <laughs> some people they are very externally conscious a kind of dress i wear you know they think that defines me if i wear the late, if i wear the most fashionable dress then i am a great person but the fashion what happens is soon goes out of fashion and when fashion goes out of fashion then a person who values fashion has to chase after the new fashion they think fashion is a form of beauty but actually soon fashion turns to be a form of ugliness that is so unbearable that we have to change it every few months so to in to think that we are equated with our genes our externals our bodily appearance and dress no that superficial but some people say okay you know i am defined by my brain hmm? i am defined by my iq level i am defined by my abilities well no that is they are certainly a part of who we are but our identity goes beyond our physicality and even our mentality or intellectuality our identity is deeper 
so now why, why does this matter understanding this actually helps us to see life's distresses in perspective so like intelligence means to align our perception with reality so the, what the gita says is that there are two levels of reality and at this level of reality distress is unavoidable and if we understand this it's like the this this intelligence if we get we stop fighting with reality we learn to make peace with reality let me explain this in a simple term say for example if we consider the world dukha layer which the gita gita uses and that is similar to another word which is quite common himalaya now himalaya what does it mean mountain, mountain. it is name of a mountain but so that's a geographical meaning a geographical reference what is it uh, etymologically or what is the literal meaning of the word sorry yes alaya is place hima is ice so it is a place of snow place of ice so you could say place of cold now if somebody goes to the himalayas and says it's so cold it's so cold it's so cold and people will say what you are saying is growing so old so old so old <laughs> is it so you get used to it that doesn't mean you have to freeze and die but stop complaining about it so if we come and live in a if we live in australia as compared to india it's colder if somebody lives in melbourne or sydney it's colder than brisbane if somebody is constantly complaining about it well you cannot fight a war with reality so intelligence means to stop fighting a futile war with reality now this does not mean that we have to stay cold all the time we can do something about the cold but complaining about the cold is not of much use so what the gita's intelligence does is it is telling arjuna that in this world distress is unavoidable and if you try to avoid distress that the attempt to avoid distress is what aggravates distress like somebody thinks okay the purpose and perfection of my life is to avoid cold and then a cold place then even a little cold that will come that will torment them hmm? so there is a certain level of acceptance that is required and this intelligence brings that acceptance that if we don't accept this so if i don't accept then the attempt to avoid distress that very thing will aggravate the distress it will only multiply the distress so how will it multiply it's not as if the problem will become big but what happens if we consider our consciousness in our consciousness there is a sensation oh i am feeling cold right mm-hmm. now if i think i don't want to feel cold and in the more i think about i don't want to feel cold but still i'm thinking about cold so what will happen by that is so by that what will happen is in that consciousness the thought of the cold will become even more prominent and that's okay it's cold i have to bear it and i wear some warm clothes and bear it so if i think my life should not have any problems then small problems will end up becoming bigger because i thought my expectation was oh there should not be any problems in my life in north america and canada so there i stayed with a devotee couple so the the husband is he is a he is a business person but he is also a priest he does marriages so he says that his hus- he does marriages and his wife is in family law the family law is just a polite word for being a divorce attorney <laughs> so he was telling me you know we joke with people we are the we are the complete combination you come to the husband to get married you come to the wife to get divorced <laughs> so he used to, so the wife was telling me that sometimes people 
come to a with such frivolous reasons for separating so there is this whole idea that because of uh, you know in now in the world romance is so much glamorized so whenever i speak on the reincarnation i have written the book on the reincarnation so the first question that comes to me in the western world is do i have a soulmate now generally my answer is first focus on the soul then you can think about the mate first understand yourself try to become a person who is a good person then you can find it right but anyway the people have this idea that, oh there is one perfect person for me out there so there was this one woman who had come to her uh, comfort he was this is why do you want to separate since you know, because my husband and i we can't agree on what temperature to have for the ac in our room in our house <laughs> Now she didn't say anything because see, there there is rigid separation of roles. An attorney cannot give advice about maintaining the marriage. For that you should go to marriage counsel. Attorney should only do what the client wants. She asks, okay, so, bro, is it my face? Is that a really reason for separating? So she said, you know, I thought he was my dream match. He was my Mr. Right. And if he were my Mr. Right. then our bodily temperature should also be aligned with each other <laughs> now this is utterly unrealistic expectation so there will always be some level of incompatibility and we need to learn to live with it so if a person's very purpose is that there should be no problem there should be no incompatibility i'm not saying there can be a less incompatible than a huge incompatible that's possible but if a person thinks right from the beginning that there should be no incompatibility then what happens is a small incompatibility becomes a huge thing so the more we try to avoid problems the more we end up aggravating them so intelligence means to accept that problems will be there in our life that distress will be there in our life that again does not mean that we passively accept distress and let people who exploit us and walk over us no it's just that we don't make it our life's purpose to avoid distress if we make that our life's purpose then that was what arjuna was trying to do at the start of the gita if i you know if i fight that's bad if i don't fight that's bad you know how can i avoid that which is bad if we start with that perspective then always be bad things in life so then what do we do okay i expect that something something distressful something negative something unpleasant will be there in my life so once i accept that then the gita talks about the next thing that what was the acronym we were discussing i i t so our first i was intelligence the second i is intention so intention can also be put as purpose intention is a strong sustained desire as like a purpose so if say somebody has gone to the himalayas and they, it's going to be cold but why are you there in the himalayas somebody says my purpose in going to the himalayas is to avoid cold well then you are really in the perfect place buddy <laughs> isn't it <laughs> certainly not so if you are going to the himalayas cold is always going to be a part of your experience but that does not mean cold has to be your only experience in the himalayas there is so much more to experience there is the beauty of the majestic snow clad mountains there is the beauty of the flora and fauna where we find it for those who have a sense of adventure you can climb up and you can go on treks and scale and conquer mountain peaks for those who seek spirituality there are various sacred places there are the caves of the sages there is badrinath there are so many other experiences available but all those experiences will be closed for somebody who is just fixated on avoiding cold and complaining about cold but say if somebody is in their consciousness 
okay that is cold that is there it's so cold but along with that they also have say a purpose okay purpose is i want to go on a pilgrimage if they're in the himalayas i'm here on a pilgrimage if they have that intention clear in their mind and then they focus on that intention and gradually what will happen is within their consciousness that intention will become prominent and in the cold will become a tiny part at the end of the day when they come back yeah, was it cold yeah it's cold but but actually i visited this place i had darshan of badrinath we had wonderful kirtan over there we heard this we did this that is what will be the prominent memory so for for us the gita is telling that rather than trying to avoid problems seek a higher purpose in life so for arjuna the intention that krishna tells us you are thinking you know which is the least bad situation is fighting less bad or not fighting less bad the gita tells arjuna that Ar- arjuna you understand that i have a higher plan for the world and you be a part of my plan and krishna's plan was to establish dharma in the world is my plan is to you are not just fighting this war so that you can gain a kingdom or you can get 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 back at people who took your kingdom you are fighting this war to be a part of my plan for for establishing the rule of virtue in the world for ushering in an era of peace and prosperity in the world an era of spiritual harmony and spiritual happiness in the world so for that purpose krishna says that if you keep that in mind then the distress of fighting the war will become lesser so krishna the gita tells krishna that uh, gita tells arjuna that krishna's purpose if that becomes arjuna's purpose that becomes arjuna's intention then what will happen is he will be absorbed in higher consciousness and that higher consciousness that consciousness shifted to a higher purpose will make the distress clear now we may say okay for arjuna we know what was krishna's purpose but what is krishna's purpose for me how do i know you know i have my job i have my family you know what 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 does krishna want me to do so that is where the gita offers as a two part teaching the intention gita says that all of us you know, sometimes we have this idea that i am here and god is up here somewhere and maybe i can pray to god maybe god will help me maybe he will not help me so when we have this conception of god that i am here and god is up there when i was introduced to bhakti about 20 25 years ago i was trying to share share bhakti wisdom with one of my friends one of my relatives he says i believe in god he is happy there i am happy here so the idea is we feel god is not relevant to me at all okay that's one way of looking at it but the point is that we no matter how happy we are right now life is going to bring problems in our life sooner or later so this idea that god is somewhere up there that is one way of looking at it but the gita explains there's another way of looking at it that each one of us is already a part of god so our individuality exists within god this is what krishna says in 15.7 when he says mamai vamsho jeeva loke jeeva bhuta sanatanah now this does not mean that you know that god exists and we exist only we, we don't have our individual existence it means that our existence is within god so there are two things at a philosophical level the gita says we are 
parts of God. And what that means at a practical level is that we are meant to be parts of God's plan. We are part of something far bigger than ourselves. And in one sense, we all long for this. Recently, we had the COVID pandemic. Now, at that time, our first priority was, you know, maybe protecting ourselves and our loved ones. I don't want to get sick. I don't want my loved ones to get sick. But suppose we had a little more voluntary spirit. Maybe we had some medical knowledge. We had some skills. So, you know, how can I be a part of the relief measure? What can I do? Now, we may think, okay, maybe I'll offer this medication or I will offer this suggestion or I'll do this, I'll do that. We could do some things. But suppose there were a very competent doctor. And that doctor was inviting people to join their team. And then if we had a part of doing that, you know, okay, the doctor said, okay, you know, you, you help do this part. Maybe help people boost their immunity. You give this protection. You tell people how to protect themselves. You to give this medication. You do this, this, this. Then what we would do, we would have much greater confidence that what we do will count. It will matter for us and it will matter for others. So similarly, the Gita tells each one of us that our endeavors do matter because we all are parts of God. And God wants, e God has for each one of us a part in His plan. The smart Tishta Yasho Labaswa. Shantan you arise and fight because I have arranged that your role will be purposeful, your role will be successful. So, so, so now, when we say what the intention that we can have, just like I talked about, okay, I'm going to the Himalayas, what is my intention? It is to have Darshan of Bhattana. When we have that intention, then the trouble doesn't matter. If we have the intention of helping people who are troubled by the pandemic, then okay, we have some inconvenience. I mean, that doesn't matter because I am doing something valuable. So, in general, most people tell us that happiness, it comes by getting something enjoyable. That's what we are told. You, know, you, you get something enjoyable, you have some delicious food to eat, you'll be happy. If you buy a new car, you buy a new phone, you get a attractive, get a relationship with somebody attractive, you'll, you'll be happy. Generally, we are taught that happiness comes by getting something enjoyable. And yes, to some extent, it is true. But the happiness from this is is tiny. It is short lived. It comes for some time. If you buy some new clothes, you feel good. But how long till people are noticing, oh, you got new clothes, they look so nice. But after some time they stop noticing and then that happiness also stops. Or if people don't notice only, then we feel even more angry. What are you blind? Do you need eye surgery? What's wrong with you? So the happiness that comes by getting something enjoyable is, is small. But there is another way to happiness. It is by progressing word something valuable now when we have something meaningful to do and when we are taking steps in moving toward that just in moving in that direction itself we get an intrinsic happiness and we can all experience this way if we if we have a child and we are raising that child and we see the child is growing up, child is learning to walk, learning to talk, learning skills. Then, that it's not that we are getting something new. We already have a child. But we are moving towards something valuable. Raising a good, responsible human being in the world. So, happiness, it is not so much a state, it is a process. 
it comes not by just getting to a particular destination it is by being in a particular process when we are moving towards something valuable we don't have to get to that valuable thing also but if we are moving towards something valuable then that itself gives us happiness and that uh, there could be many valuable things the gita says the most valuable thing is service to krishna that why service to krishna because krishna has a plan for the world and when we become a part of krishna's plan then what we are doing becomes supremely valuable just like somebody trying to hand some medical use of as a medical support to someone based on their understanding that means there's some value to it but if they are aligned with a medical expert then what they are doing is much more valuable so for us happiness comes in the process of having something valuable to move towards and krishna tells arjuna that if you become a part of my plan then you will be doing something valuable you are just valuable something supremely valuable and then what as we as is this question earlier okay krishna told arjuna you have to fight but what is it that we can do what is it that krishna wants us to do? this is where the gita has a very beautiful very inclusive vision of life if we consider god exists above all of us so now we are here as small beings so the gita tells us that now even when we are existing here in the world we are still a part of god we are still a part of god's plan and is referring back to the that conception is also not wrong but that is not the only conception that god exists outside of us but so what we have the gita says that is god's gift to us and what we do with what we have that can be our gift to god so whatever we have we have certain interests we have certain talents we have certain resources what do we do with what we have that can be our gift to god so most people for example say are told that oh you need to make money to be happy yeah money is required in life it's a necessity functional necessity but while making money is important what we are making with money is even more important what are we using the money for so going back to the earlier point happiness comes by getting something enjoyable so getting something enjoyable would be here is making money yeah making money is fair or oh, fine but what we are making with money are we using it just for short term enjoyment are we using it for some noble charitable cause for saving for ourselves for for helping others so what we are making with money that is even more important otherwise for many people the more money they get the more they may sometimes get addicted to unhealthy behaviors and self destructive habits and that can become the cause of their destruction so when we have this mood of service yeah i have a family i have a job but all of these are ultimately meant to be of service to krishna so whatever we are doing yes we could have problems in our family we could have problems in our job we could have problems in our society but if we have that higher purpose okay this is a situation i am in but what is good about this situation what are the good things i see those are god's gift to me and using those good things what can i do what can i do in a mood of service the acting in a mood of service means that okay god is the well wisher of everyone i will also try to be a well wisher how can i act to make things better the situation is there it, it may not be the best situation but whatever is good in the situation how can i use that to make things better so you know this 
when we talk about in terms of attitude mm -hmm. if we have a controlling or enjoying attitude mm -hmm. then even if one or two things are wrong then it just destroys us it destroys our happiness you know if this person not listening to me this is not right like i said you no know, okay the air air condition temperature is not right for me if my purpose is to enjoy i'll just be annoyed i'll be miserable but so if this controlling enjoying attitude it will lead to misery so this is not a healthy attitude but on the other hand if we have a service attitude okay in this situation service attitude means simply this is the situation i am in i i accept the situation generally when we say if i am in a service position that means i am not the top in charge so i have to work within some limitations and we accept the situation but we also accept the responsibility to improve the situation okay i can't fix the whole world but i can fix my corner of the world let me do what i can to improve things and if we have this attitude we'll find that even amid negative situations some positivity will come within us because we are trying to do something positive so it is on one side when suddenly the power goes off we can we can curse the darkness or we can turn on our flashlight our flashlight does not replace the street lights but our flashlight at least gives us some light so that is the intention if you have the intention let me try to do things let me try to improve things from wherever they are so we'll find that from that point we can always move positively forward and we say yeah i'm trying to improve things but still life is so difficult it's so so troublesome it's so tiring it's so exhausting and that brings us to the last part or the last thing t so t is taste taste here refers to higher happiness so in bhakti bhakti at one level i said means that we see what god has given us as gifts and we try to use them return them in a mood of service to use them for the good so this taste in bhakti comes when we have a holistic vision of bhakti is there is the i started by talking about the spiritual level of reality and there is a material level of reality so one understanding is that god exists here in the spiritual level of reality and that is not a wrong understanding it is just not a complete understanding so that was is this understanding bhakti means that we go from this world towards god and yes that is one part of bhakti but what the bhagavad gita explains is yat ittah pravrittir bhutana yena sarvam idam datam that actually krishna doesn't just exist at the spiritual level of reality krishna exists in this world also god doesn't just exist on only on the altar in the temple god exists in our hearts God exists in the world God is there in our office God is there in our home God is everywhere So when we are serving Krishna it's not just we are serving Krishna by turning towards him we serve Krishna in this world also So bhakti has two aspects to it One is immersive bhakti Immersive means we turn away from this world and focus on Krishna We immerse ourselves in Krishna The Gita talks about this bhakti in twelve point eight and nine, and in bhakti also has another aspect that is inclusive bhakti. Inclusive means the world is included in the domain of our service to Krishna, because God exists in this world also. So when we have this understanding, then. we may have to face the problems in the world and we want to act purposefully so the earlier bhakti that i talked about the intention 
that is primarily inclusive bhakti that we act in the world in a mood of service but bhakti also has an essential immersive part immersive part means we turn away from the world absorb ourselves in kirtan absorb ourselves in krishna's pastimes absorb ourselves in the worship of krishna absorb ourselves immerse ourselves in the remembrance of krishna and by this we will find that here and now we will get taste we will experience relief we will experience joy so it's not that we experience krishna only when we go from this world to the other world here itself to the extent we immerse ourselves in krishna to that extent we can experience relief we can experience joy we can experience strength so that way this taste which we get in bhakti gives us the strength to face life situations so when we act in the mood of service to krishna see when there are problems we deal with the problems we want to solve the problems that means we seek if i am having problems i seek for example at one level i seek release from problems those problems should go away and yes if we act purposefully many problems can be minimized some can even be removed and this release from problems comes gradually by inclusive bhakti when we act in a mood of service using our god given intelligence and abilities we can minimize problems we can fix situations but while we are here while the problems are still there that time our immersive bhakti our immersive bhakti becomes like a shield for us so even amid the problems somebody might be sick but if at that time they hear krishna's name they hear kirtan they hear katha even that sickness they will find that their consciousness is rising upwards so this immersive bhakti gives us relief amid problems the problems are not yet gone away but this gives us relief amid the problems and that's why it's important for each one of us to also seek and savor taste in bhakti we find out which are the activities in bhakti that can give us shelter when we feel distressed when we feel troubled what can we immerse ourselves in and in that way we will find that we can pass through even the toughest of challenges that life sends our way this is arjuna by the end of the bhagavad gita he was not only convinced that krishna had a purpose for him when he was going to fight the war but krishna had also manifested in his heart that's why he says nashto moha sutil labdha tat prasadat maya chuta sthito smrit sandeh he had not just experienced krishna's purpose that i had to fulfill krishna's purpose but he was also experiencing krishna's presence and when he experienced krishna's presence kata sandeh right here where i am krishna is with me it is krishna is with my heart within with me within my heart and that understanding that appreciation that awareness is krishna consciousness so krishna we are souls and krishna is right next to us how much is this distance between us and krishna any idea is already there yes it is just is one thought away if we just think about him we start experiencing his presence and the more taste we have the more our thought of krishna becomes steady and the more we experience his presence so inclusive bhakti makes us a part of krishna's purpose yes i am a part of something bigger than myself and that gives us meaning that gives us value to our life immersive bhakti 
gives us krishna's presence right now krishna is with me here and that gives us relief in our distress and in this way we can as krishna said mat prasadat darishasi you can go over the toughest of problems you can go, go through and grow through life's toughest problems and summarize what i discussed today we talked about how gita wisdom can help us face life's distresses i talked about three points based on acronym what are the acronym i i t yes what are the first i intelligence yes intelligence so intelligence basically we discussed multiple definitions of intelligence first was that perception and reality are aligned together and what is that perception and reality aligned together that means the gita says that that we stop fighting stop our war with distress in this world just like in the himalayas there is going to be cold we accept that in this world there is going to be cold that doesn't mean i have to suffer cold. it just means i have to stop complaining stop expecting that i will don't make avoiding distress the purpose of life if we don't stop fighting distress then what happens is we is one thing if we avoid problems what happens by that we aggravate problems remember this diagram i dot dot how if there is a particular problem we try to fixate on it then what happens that problem itself becomes bigger and it consumes our consciousness so the more we try to avoid problems the more we aggravate them so that is intelligence then the second i was intention now we talked about in intention that means that if we understand that we can be a part of something bigger than ourselves just like if i go to the himalayas if i understand my purpose is not just to avoid cold over here it is to have darshan of the nadi is to go to this mountain peak then that fills our consciousness so what we could do over here is if in our consciousness there is a purpose and that purpose fills our consciousness then the distress becomes insignificant it is there but it is hardly noticeable so intention means basically we align our will with krishna's will we understand that krishna has we we, we have a service attitude by which we try to do our part in krishna's plan we are parts of krishna that means we are meant to be parts of krishna's plan and krishna's plan was we discussed how what we have that is krishna's gift to us and what we do what what he have that is our gift to krishna and last t was taste so that means that we talk about bhakti as two aspects to it one is the in inclusive bhakti where we try to serve krishna in this world and by this we will get release from problems we will work to solve problems gradually but bhakti also has another aspect immersive bhakti so immersive bhakti means relief we can experience even now relief amid problems and in that way even through the toughest of situations we can experience krishna's presence he is just one thought away from us and just like if it's extremely cold you know when okay i want to climb up the mountain that's good and that's my higher purpose that's helping me know yeah but here you know there is a there is a, there is a small room which is well heated okay let me go in that room let me get relief over there let me just rejuvenate myself let me relax myself. and then i can come out i can even move forward so like that for us immersive bhakti gives us relief right now and that can give us the strength to engage in inclusive bhakti 
and when we balance our mind between immersive and inclusive bhakti then we'll find that we can go through and grow through the challenges that life sends us by krishna's mercy thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna are there any questions or comments understand Krishna's plan? So, very good question. Thank you for asking that. See, Krishna's plan, sometimes you may think, it's like one narrow path. And if I get off this path, then I'm not on Krishna's plan. But Krishna's plan is not like that. Krishna's plan, is it one narrow path? At every moment, I am doing this, I am Krishna's plan. Not doing this, I am not on Krishna's plan. Krishna doesn't want to micro-control us. If you see, after the Bhagavad Gita, what happened? The Mahabharata war happened. And in the Mahabharata war, Krishna didn't try to micro-control Arjuna. Although Krishna was right next to Arjuna, it was, Arjuna said, Krishna, I will do your will. But it was not that before fighting, shooting every arrow, Arjuna said, Krishna, do you have my approval? Do I have your approval? No, Arjuna was using his intelligence, his expertise. Today I will fight with this enemy. Today I will take on that division. And Krishna supported him. Sometimes Krishna intervened. Yeah, today, you know, when he wanted to get to Jayadrat and he was fighting with Drona, Arjuna, said, Arjuna was told by Krishna, hey, the war with Drona can go on all day. Don't spend so much time with it. Go ahead, right? So sometimes Krishna intervened. So Krishna's, even when Krishna was right next to Arjuna, Krishna was not micro controlling Arjuna. And doing Krishna's plan doesn't mean that we had to be micro controlled by Krishna. Hmm? No, Krishna's plan is more like a one direction. It is more of a direction. It's like this is, a, this is a huge expressway and on that expressway there could be many lanes so one person might choose to go on one lane another person might choose to go on another lane and sometimes the same person might move from one lane to another lane that's perfectly fine it is not that Krishna's plan is is something mysterious so when in the, it's mysterious in the sense that and if you don't know it, we are lost for it. It's not like that. What Krishna's plan is that we all grow in our spirituality. We all, we all develop the potentials that Krishna has given us. We do justice to the abilities that he has given us. So the ultimate purpose of Krishna is for us to become full, fully developed individuals who, who have a deep connection with him and who make a valuable contribution in this world. So, inclusive bhakti, I talk about inclusive. Inclusive bhakti leads to connection with Krishna. And immersive bhakti leads to contribution in this world. We all can make a difference in this world. And that's what Krishna wants each one of us to do. So, it's more of a direction. Now, when Vishma is specifically saying that Nobody can understand Krishna's plan. He's talking more about specifics. So why did the Pandavas, who were so virtuous, have to suffer so terribly? What really was, what was really Krishna's, uh, Krishna's intention behind all that happening? That, when a particular thing happens, why exactly is this particular thing happening? Finding that out will be very difficult. Sometimes we may be able to, but sometimes it may just be beyond us. Maybe later on we'll realize 
Like, why did Prabhu, all of Prabhupada's uh, attempts to share Krishna Bhakti in India fail? Now we understand Krishna had a different way to glorify him. And in the old age when most people would have given up, he came to all the way to America and he glorified Krishna. And he, that, that ended up in his glory being revealed to the world. But at that time, I mean, Prabhupada, why is nothing working? He didn't know. So he was just doing his best, trying this, trying that, trying that. So once we get into the specifics, why is this particular thing happening to me? We, may not, we can't read Krishna's mind, you know, Krishna is doing this because of this. <coughs> that is a little presumptuous if you try to do that. But okay, in this situation, how can I best serve Krishna? Think of that and try to take small steps forward. That we can definitely do. Look at the Bhagavad Gita itself. No, Krishna did not go into any esoteric revelation from some previous life. Telling Arjuna that you know, Bhishma was this person in that life and you were that person in that life and you had done these two things and that's why now both of you have to fight each other. Krishna didn't do that. Krishna just focused on this is the situation. Let's make the best of this bad situation. So when we talk about Krishna's plan, it can I'll conclude this answer this two points. Krishna's plan, when Bhishma says we, what we can't know, that is why we are in our situation. Why exactly we are in this situation? That we may not always be able to know. But what we can know is what to do in this situation. How should we serve Krishna in this situation? But that also, we may not always know at the absolute certainty. But we explore. We try something out, if it works well and good, we consult senior devotees, we, we study scripture and develop our own intelligence. And by that, we move forward. Okay? Thank you. Any last question before we stop? Yes, please. How do you know that we are, we are imaginating or how do you clarify that we are experiencing Krishna? Krishna is giving us a guidance or how this experience thing happens? Okay. What does experiencing Krishna mean? Well, the experience of Krishna is beyond words. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's a shortcut answer. The long cut answer is, I'll tell you many words which will essentially say that Krishna's experience is beyond words. <laughs> Well, let's put it this way, that we all have, if you consider our experiences, you know, there are some ordinary experiences we have. You know, as we experience heat, we experience cold, we experience some conflict, we experience some peace. All these experiences we have ordinary. But then we also have some extraordinary experiences. Mm -hmm. So, now these extraordinary experiences, they are pointers towards Krishna. Jayosmi Vavasa, Yosmi. Krishna says, I am victory, I am adventure. So, these extraordinary experiences that we have, they point to some higher reality, beyond the humdrum reality of the daily world. And people long for those experiences, just like Climbing up the Himalayas, it can be a long, troublesome, tiresome uh, trek. But when you get to the top, and then you plant a flag over there, that is a sense of victory, it's a sense of adventure. So, that is, that is an extraordinary experience. Now, is that an experience of Krishna? Well, it's an experience of a spark of Krishna. That is a vibhuti of Krishna. So, now such extraordinary experiences, you People are ready to risk their life to get those experiences. But if you these, if you take these drops and multiply them till it become an ocean, that ocean is what? Or that ocean of experience is what Krishna gives us through Krishna Bhakti. Now, how do we know we are experiencing it? It is generally we are at a particular level of reality and suddenly we feel lifted above that. I have this problem and this issue and that issue and I come to a temple, I come in satsang 
I hear some katha, I do some but suddenly I feel a relief. I feel as if I'm rising upwards. So we may not exactly perceive Krishna at that time. But what we experience is that as if we are being lifted above the problem. When we experience Krishna, Krishna is so great, Krishna is so greatly reassuring and fulfilling that the problems, they just, okay, they are there but they don't threaten us so much. Maybe we feel lifted above. The extraordinary experiences at one level, they are pointers to Krishna. Pointers more to the experience of Krishna. Hmm? But in Bhakti, they are lifters. Like lifters above life's problems, life's issues. So suppose, now say a small baby is sleeping. Now initially the baby is really small, she doesn't even know that there is a person called my mother. Now the baby just you know, it puts his mouth somewhere and something soft comes from that something soft and it's just enjoying it. But as the baby starts growing, starts sensing, you know, this is a person and this person loves me. Now, suppose that baby is asleep and, and suddenly the temperature drops and the baby starts trembling. Then the mother notices it and the mother puts a comforter on the baby. Now, the, the, the baby has not actually awakened. The baby has not consciously opened its eyes and seen the mother. But even the sleeping state, just by the relief coming from the comforter, the baby understands, here's my mother, my mother is there caring for me, and my mother is going to come back. So similarly for us, initially we are like babies. You know, whatever gives us enjoyment, we take that enjoyment. We don't even think from where, from what source that enjoyment is coming. But gradually we start understanding that there is some benevolent being who is giving us things like that. And then, even if we are presently asleep, but when we face some distress, and then, suddenly, we experience relief from the distress. We understand that is Krishna's hand on us. That is Krishna giving us relief. So, that experience of Krishna, we are right now sleeping souls. When we wake, we will see Krishna. But even if we can't see Krishna, the relief that we feel, the joy that we feel, the upliftment that we feel, all these are experiences of Krishna. They are like the baby feeling the blind, feeling warmth and she inf the baby infers the mother's love. So at our level, we all need to infer Krishna's love in our life. And gradually, we will, as we wake up, we will experience Krishna directly. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Tai Gaur Primaan ki.